So, hi everybody, welcome um, to today. Today we're going to be talking to Ash Fontana, who's a managing director of Zeta Ventures. So Zeta is actually very, very, very well known uh, in the States. I'm in Australia and I've heard of it. Um, I'm not so sure what the penetration is here, but we'll let Ash tell us in a second. They're definitely very successful in San Francisco and uh, the Bay Area. Uh, they specialize in, I would say, investment into AI first companies, possibly more towards a B2B, a business to business side, but um, they may be open. We'll let Ash talk about that in a second. And just in case um, you guys are not familiar with Ash, the short is he's successful in both as being an investor and a founder and he seems to have a keen eye and a good opinion. So Ash, unless I've missed something striking, is that good enough? Too generous. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Oh, that makes it nice and easy. We'll, we'll yeah. jump straight into the kind of business stuff. Just tell us a little bit about your your fund, what kind of companies mm -hmm. you like to invest in, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of flights you buy. Cool. So we're very focused. We focus on companies that develop a competitive advantage through data and compound that with some sort of self-learning system and selling something to another business. So not direct to consumer. And we invest at ideally at the earliest stages of a company's formation. So, you know, usually the first million dollars into a company, usually the first board member, the first person to sign, we want to be the first person to contribute a significant amount of capital and time and be the most important invest to the companies as they go from that point of having an idea and maybe a product or a prototype and getting their first real customers. Cool. So that's what we do. I'm slightly even more focused on that. I personally tend to focus on companies that are more global, less in North America, particularly in the UK and Europe, but also Australia, because I'm obviously from there and go there a bit. I tend to focus on companies building tools and infrastructure. So building software or software hardware platforms that enable other people to do things. Um, so things for developers, engineers and whatnot is what I tend to focus on um, and tend to focus a little bit more on companies that are selling bottom up, so to speak, you know, through, um, uh, to, through an open source community or um, through uh, sort of giving something out to developers and seeing how they use it and then, you know, eventually selling after that. So that's, that's sort of just a even more nuance on my particular focus right now, but the fund is B2B, AI and earliest stages. I'll be straight up honest, Ash. It's absolute mm -hmm. music to my ears because I, <laughs> I, I hear way too often, uh, you know, the engin engineers amongst us saying, mm -hmm. I predominantly focus on back end. I predominantly just want to make the tools to make the job easier. Who would care mm -hmm. on me? Who would be interested? Who would be looking this way? Who's going to help me get past the first gate? And you've basically just mm. put your hand up and said, yeah, that's us. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that because we think that's a bit of a gap. You know, people, I think it's always a gap to be earlier, so to speak, to back someone where no one else believes in it, where no one else sees the opportunity, where no one else sees that what they're trying to do is technically possible. You know, that's always something that is going to give you an advantage as an investor and a founder something that they, because a founder can get something they can't get from anywhere else. So um, that's always the case, but specifically, yeah, it's good to hear that. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent. So kind of going off that, how, how do you rate uh, robotics as an investment priority? Would, would yeah. You... Yeah, go. Sorry. Um, so look, for us, it's a priority, but with a twist. And so what that is, is, Firstly, anyone building something to help other people build robots is someone I want to work with because there's obviously so many ways in which we can deploy robots into the world and they're still really hard to build. Um, you know, so many components of everything from, you know, obviously fabrication and chip making and things like that, but, you know, just through to control systems, fleet management, training, um, and this is where, you know, I'm most experienced training uh training robots to do things training the models that run that run on the robots etc cetera, etc cetera. so firstly yes very interested in helping the robotics ecosystem mature and getting more robots into the world um mostly by helping 
people build tools that help other people build robots. Secondly, I would call a lot of basic data collection sensors robots in a way. Yep. Um, and we're very interested in those businesses because they can collect data that, again, other people can use to build really interesting predictive models or automation systems. Um, so that's the second area we're quite interested in. And then thirdly, yeah, certain robotics applications um, uh, in certain industries are of interest. I would say that's definitely our third priority in terms of where we look for investments in the robotics field, not because it involves more hardware necessarily, that is part of it, and we'll get to that. It's more that it tends to be the case that uh, to get a robot to a sufficient degree of performance in certain industries means you have to really focus, and that often means focusing on like one particular uh, industry. So. That can be hard for us to back, but you know we can we can get it there too. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because you know, sitting on this mm -hmm. side of the curtain, I, I hear quite often, you know, we work on robotics, but if you actually mm -hmm. dig into it, that's kind of like saying you work on automotive. So yeah, exactly. Do you make the tires? Do you make the wheels? Do you make the gears? Do you make the engine? Yeah. Do you make the drive shaft. Sure, mm -hmm. it fits into that umbrella, but if you think about it that umbrella is very broad. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of look the other way and like, you know, there's a bit of sticker shock almost. You say robotics to some people and they're like, oh, we don't do robotics. But then I think you've right. quite eloquently said, well, kind of everything is though, right? So a sensor is and mm. the computer is and an actuator yeah. is and everything. So it really depends exactly. on the application. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Oh, um, you're making me very happy. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that's that's good to hear. <laughs> it is good. It's good to be. Um, this might be a good mm -hmm. time to kind of remind everyone that you recently wrote a book on yeah, sure. the things like to invest, uh, how to invest, or how how mm -hmm. we on the other side should spend the money, how we should approach, how we should go mm -hmm. about trying to launch. Yeah, yeah. The book is called the AI First Company. Um. You can check out more on the airfirstcompany.com. You can buy it anywhere. Um, and it's really about how you structure a company, a team, allocate capital, think about your strategy, price your product, et cetera. How you approach everything from day one, just a little bit differently, if you want to build a competitive advantage through AI. And you know, it really is the case that there are all these constituent challenges um, if you really, if that is your goal, if you really want to do that. Mm. Um, and I faced those challenges with these founders over the years and developed a lot of knowledge around um, how to solve them. And I tried to share that in this book. So um, that's the idea of the book, that's what it does. And, you know, it's partially a book about vocabulary and theory and like helping you, you articulate what advantage you get um, by collecting unique data, processing it, feeding it into a self-learning system. It's partially about measuring that, but it's also just about building it. How do you get data? How do you run machine learning teams? How do you monitor these systems? Um, so it's both, um, or it's all three of those things. So it is you know, theoretical and practical uh, and it has a progression. And yeah, the big ideas are, you know, you've got to be AI first. Um, you've got to put it at the forefront of every agenda and every conversation about everything. And two, there's this new competitive advantage called a data learning effect, which is probably intuitive to a lot of people here, but it's articulated in the book. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say straight out, I've got no eggs in the basket. I, I don't get a cut from the book, but, but with <laughs> that, I would actually recommend everyone kind of gets into it for, for two reasons. One is the stock standard operational. So if you're going to try and do something, anyone that gives you a hint on a better way to do it or another way to do it, another perspective, that can only be good. The worst case you can say is I, I know better, maybe. The best case is you learn better and it goes better. The, the other thing which I think is huge is no matter how much you try Dash, it's gonna have a bit of an investor lens on it, which mm -hmm. kind of gives us some insights into how mm -hmm. to present ourselves to be investable. So mm -hmm. what are the aspects you're gonna be looking for? What are you gonna be thinking about? What, when you run your you know, magnifying glass over the top, what are the key bits that you, you're going to think about or you're going to want to have answers to? So I, I think it'd be great if you kind of grabbed onto a few of those of 
what are the couple of things that you really want to see when you're looking at a company? What do you want to hear? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, the book is very much for people who are running companies, but yeah, it does give uh, people an insight into how those investing companies think about allocating capital, you know, both in general to a company. And then once they're, you know, for example, on the board of a company, how they think, how they might think about it. I don't think many investors think that way today, but some of them might um, eventually. So yeah, what do we look for? Um, look, it's all the usual things, right? You know, is the company um, being started by really phenomenal people who are just gonna um, have the requisite drive to keep going at the right times? Yeah. Is the company fundamentally developing something that's really hard to develop, like really valuable intellectual property? So all the usual things, but you know, what we really look for or look to is the data they've collected, the system they're training, and the efficacy of that system. We really jump into those experiments and try to understand you know, how close is this system to predicting something of value or automating something that's really expensive? And you know, how much does that mean to customers? So the first part of that is technical, does it work? How close are they to making this prediction or this automation system work? And the second part of that is very market driven, which is, is it valuable? Um, and for the first part, we rely on our expertise and occasionally the expertise of others. And for the latter part, we talk to people that are either already customers or could be customers in future. Um, so, you know, we look for all the usual things. We particularly look to those experiments and see how, if they're working and they can be just on small data sets, they can be just one or two different models. They don't have to be elaborate. They don't have to be in production, but we, that's what we look to. And then, you know, we then validate that with, with others. Yeah, cool, cool. Hmm. So just to kind of take a little bit of a maybe half step or quarter step back, how, mm -hmm. how, how do you like to be approached? Like what's the best way, if, if I've got an idea, I think you might be interested in what's the best thing for me to do? Yeah, um, it really is just to write a good cold email um, saying, here's what I do. Here's what's hard about it. Here's the hardest problem we've solved technically and as, as concisely as you possibly can. And here's the validation we have that this could be really valuable with customers, with people who could buy it. And you know that can be as, uh, as straightforward as something that could be expressed in a paragraph or two if you're quite far along. If you're a bit earlier, it might be harder to articulate, but you know, a cold email um, is completely fine and always works um, if, it's, if it's thoughtful. And if you've shown that you know, you get why we could be a good partner for you. Um, Cause you know, I only want to work with people if I can really help them. You know, no one likes to just be in a situation where they're not really adding any incremental value to the world. Um, and to know that, you know, the company that is approaching us is one that we could help um, requires them helping us understand, you know, what they do and how it relates to the areas we focus on. So cold email, those three things, you know, who we are, what hard problem we've solved and what validation we have and how it might relate to, you know, our strategy as a fund. That'll always work. Yeah. And I, I hope this is true for, for you. I haven't mm -hmm. asked you, but I often tell people, um, lots of people are busy. Lots of people get lots of things like emails. So if it's mm -hmm. been a week or two and you haven't got a response, don't take it any way personal. Mm -hmm. Don't take it way, any way or the other. Maybe a friendly, hey, just getting this back to the top. Is there something else you want to know? Just it could have mm. just simply slipped through a gap. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that because you know, look, we all get a lot of email. I get hundreds a day that need a response, and you know, everyone has their own prioritization systems. And sometimes I just have stuff that needs to be done that day, and every email does get answered. Um, but pushing it up the top of the priority list is sort of a way to say, well, I don't care about your prioritization system. I just want to push mine at the top. So I appreciate you saying that because uh, I certainly have a view on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can push one, sure. Yep. Um, just, just to kind of go on for that, just say hypothetically, mm -hmm. we had an email and you liked it. What was the mm -hmm. kind of deal flow from there look like? Yeah, look, 
know, we'll meet, we'll talk through some things, we'll ideally get some materials ahead of time so we can start that meeting at a rung on the ladder of abstraction that's below like, what do you do? So start that meeting with more specific questions um, and dig into it. And after that first meeting, we'll have a, a better idea of where we need to better understand the technology or the market need. And we'll figure out what we need to do after that, what our plan is. Um, so that's something that um, we can only do usually after doing a bit of reading in a meeting. Um, and then it'll be probably a second meeting with something more specific, a bunch of more specific questions, usually technical. And then after that, we have to decide, you know, whether we want to take up any more of your time um, and of course ours, and, and then the time of others to do things like call them and ask them if they wouldn't use the technology in their, in their company. Yeah. Um, and so we're really serious at that point um, after that second meeting. And then we form a plan. We figure out what questions we really have to grapple with to have enough conviction that we're the right investors for the company yeah. and that you know, we can really make a difference. And we'll work through those questions through a series of customer calls and diligence. But you know, at that point, it's less up to us in terms of the timeline. It's more up to when we can get on the phone to two or three people. So it's usually two meetings and then two or three other calls. Um, and then that's it. Yeah. So I, I, I find it really interesting, right? Because having played the game a, a little bit, it, it mm -hmm. seems like the, it starts off casual, you know, almost a coffee and a chat. And then it slowly mm -hmm. escalates up to get more and more. So you keep getting asked more questions, but the mm -hmm. length of the answer needs to say kind of the same for the interest to stay. Mm -hmm. But yet on the other side, there seems to be this, oh, we know the first meeting needs to be a six hour presentation where we go through every thought we've ever had, which is kind of cute, I'll be honest with you. Sure. But, uh, but the thing that gets me down is the frustration. So like seeing like, you know, let's say the founder being frustrated that you just won't listen or you won't give me time to answer or you won't give me time to tell you everything. Mm. And it's like, well, we've only just met. I don't even know what you do. I was going to come to the three hour lecture, but I was going to do that in the second or third meeting. Uh, why don't you just tell me your name to start with? I, I find that frustrating mm. just unneeded, unhelpful and just distracting. Like it, it, it can start off casual. Yeah, exactly. It totally can. Look, all of these things start in different ways. Sometimes, you know, it's the case you're talking to someone you've known for many, many years. Um, and so, you know, you can just jump straight into the specifics, but yeah, it, it just really depends. Yeah, go with the flow. Exactly. Okay, so I'll come at um, come for your opinion on a few of the, the common type myths, mm -hmm. just to see what you think. Um, okay. Pl please don't tell me that they're true, otherwise you ruin my world. But feel free to be mm -hmm. honest because that's actually more useful. Sure. So, so this um co common common myth that you know investing into hardware is really hard, and no one wants to invest in robotics or anything challenging because it's really hard, and the concept mm -hmm. of it's going to take us a long time before we get any traction or make anything makes it un uninteresting to even invest into and no one likes high capex anything and no one likes you know a system you've got to keep running and moving uh what do you think about any of that well look i mean it is the case that some companies just take more investment to get to the point where they have a product that's usable by customers uh but it's it's also the case that there's there a lot, there's a lot of money out there, there are a lot of funds out there. So you, know, you just have to be honest about how much you need to build a system that customers can use, that can they can put into production, and approach funds with enough money. Um, you know, it's it's probably fair to say that if you're approaching an investor and they're like, "Well, we don't invest in hardware," whether or not they articulate it this way, it's probably fair to say they don't invest in hardware because they don't have money to invest in hardware. And that's one of two, they have one of two problems. Either they don't realize that your particular hardware company doesn't actually require that much money to get to market. They just made an assumption or that it does require a lot and they don't have it. Um, and so it's sometimes a communication problem. Like, no, we actually don't need to buy this. We can get a contract manufacturer to cover the cost or we don't need to hold this in inventory or we don't need to um, spend that much money on test devices. Um, you know, we actually can get to market, get something in customers' hands that they will pay for with less than a million dollars um, or whatever it is. Um, and here's the breakdown. So sometimes it's a communication problem. Um, and sometimes it's 
uh, again, just a selection problem, which is, you know, you've just actually found yourself talking to an investor that is, is, is someone with a fund that's just not big enough. Um, so you just got to work it out. I, I, yeah. I don't know. I feel kind of weird because it feels like you're reading the inside of my mind. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I do find that a lot. And I, th I think that's a big advantage or big um, mm -hmm. idea of why it's a good idea to find a VC that actually fits or it's actually aligned because your mm -hmm. ability, ability to help and ability to amplify outcomes is astronomical. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you might have a good idea, a good plan. They run it past the VC and they're like, have you thought of this? Have you tried that? This might shortcut that. That yeah. might go there. And then the classic, it's you, you, you shouldn't convolute no, I won't give you five million dollars because mm -hmm. I don't have five million dollars. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't convolute that with because I don't like your idea. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's often just a function of their strategy, not anything else. Yeah. And so there are different no's. Um, don't take them to heart. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. We'll finish on probably an an interesting one. What can mm -hmm. we do as a community to make ourselves a bit more investable or a bit more interesting? And is investing in Australia an option at all? Yeah. So the second one's easy. Of course, investing in Australia is an option, I think, from my perspective. You know, it's phenomenal people there to work on ideas. There's good government support. You know, there's good communications with other people you might need to work with. I mean, absolutely. It's not even a question for me. Um, might be for others. I don't know why. But that's that. What uh, Robotics Australia can do as a community to make a lot of the community members' ideas more investable is, I think, just help each other communicate better the cost of bringing certain technologies to market. As, as you sort of said earlier, in financial terms um, that people can understand, you know, it's, it's not so easy to just look at a technology and go, all right, this is how much it's going to take to bring it to market because there's a lot of nuance in how that technology is going to be developed and tested and you know what needs to be invented from scratch what you can just pull off the shelf unless you've got deep experience in the domain you can't tell that so you need to work with the person inventing the technology to figure that out and the, vice versa the person with the technology or inventing the technology needs to work with the person funding it to work out how much it's going to cost they might have ideas about how to better fund it you know you could get debt financing for this you could structure your contract like that so you don't have to pay so much up front so just working with more um people in the industry that are on the investing side to um to figure out the fundamental question which is is that what does it take to get this to market how much capital do we have to do that um and what's it going to be worth as well is of course the other side of the equation hmm. Um, so yeah, that's it. Just work on different ways to communicate, help each other, you know, create models that, for example, explain a bill of materials really well. Um, or for example, you know, uh, spec out the cost of building your own chip um, or whatever else and share those materials with each other so that you can then communicate better with the people funding these things. Yeah, you, you say it almost dismissively like that's it, but I think that's <laughs> extremely thoughtful and extremely helpful. So thank you very much for that, Ash. And thank you very, very much for your time, mate. You're welcome. Very good to talk to you.